Hey, I'm Mandy from Deep Lizard. In this episode, we'll see how we can use a neural network for inference to predict on data from a test set using TensorFlow's Keras API. As we touched on previously, whenever we train a model, the hope is that we can then take that model and use it on new data that it had not seen before during training. And hopefully the model is able to generalize well and give us good results on this new data. So as a simple example, suppose that we trained a network to be able to identify images of cats or dogs. And so during the training process, of course, we had a training set that uh, say we downloaded from a website with thousands of images of cats and dogs. So the hope is later that if we wanted to, we could maybe build a web app, for example, and we could have people from all over the world submit their dog and cat photos and have our model tell them with high accuracy whether or not their animal is a cat or a dog. So I don't know why anyone would actually make that web app, but you get the point. The hope is that even though the images that are being sent in from people around the world of their own cats and dogs, even though those weren't included in the training set that the model was originally trained on, hopefully the model's able to generalize well enough to understand from what it's learned about dog and cat features that it can predict that Mandy's dog is actually a dog and not a cat, for example. We call this process inference. So the model takes what it learned during training and then uses that knowledge to infer things about data that it hasn't seen before. In practice, we might hold out a subset of our training data to put in a set called the test set. Typically, after the model has been trained and validated, we take the model and use it for inference purposes against the test set, just as one additional step to the validation to make sure that the model is generalizing well before we deploy our model to production. So at this point, the model that we've been working with over the last few episodes has been trained and validated. And given the metrics that we saw during the validation process, we have a good idea that the model is probably going to do a pretty good job at inference on the test set as well. In order to conclude that though, we first would need to create a test set. So we're going to do that now. And then after we create the test set, then we'll use the model for inference on it. All right, so we are back in our Jupyter notebook, and now we're going to go through the process of creating the test set. And actually, if you just glance at this code here, you can see that this whole process of setting up the, uh, the samples and labels list and then generating the data from the imagined clinical trial that we discussed in a previous episode, we're then taking that generated data and uh, putting it into NumPy array format, then shuffling that data, and then uh, scaling the data to be on a scale from 0 to 1 rather than from the scale of 13 to 100. So actually that is the same exact process using almost the same exact code except for we're working with our test labels and test samples variables rather than train labels and train samples. So we're not going to go line by line through this code. If you need a refresher, go check out the earlier episode where we did the exact same process for the training set. The important thing to take from this process though is that the test set should be prepared and processed in the same format as the training data was. So we'll just go ahead and run the cells to test and or to create and process the test data. And now we are going to use our model to predict on the test data. So to obtain predictions from our model, we call predict on the model that we created in the last couple of episodes. So we are calling model.predict and we are first passing in this parameter x, which we're setting equal to our scaled test samples. So that is what we created in just the line above where we scaled our test samples to be on a scale from zero to one. So this is the data that we want our model to predict on. Then we specify the batch size and we are setting the batch size equal to 10, which is the exact same batch size that we used for our training data whenever we train the model as well. And then the last parameter we're specifying is this verbose parameter. We're setting this equal to zero because during predicting there is not any output um, from this function that we actually care about seeing or that is going to be any use to us at the moment. So we're setting that equal to zero to get no output. 
All right, so then if we run this cell, then our model predicts on all of the data in our test set. And if we want to have a visualization of what each of these predictions from the model looks like for each sample, we can print them out here. So looking at these predictions, the way that we can interpret this is for each element within our test set, so for each sample in our test set, we are getting a probability that maps to either the patient not experiencing a side effect or the patient experiencing a side effect. So for the first sample in our test set, this prediction says that the model is 92 or is assigning a 92% probability to this patient not experiencing a side effect and just a uh, around 8% probability of the patient experiencing a side effect. So recall that we said uh, no side effect experience was labeled as a zero and a side effect experience was labeled as a one. So that is how we know that this particular probability maps to not having a side effect because it's in the zeroth index and this specific probability maps to having a side effect because it is in the first index. So if we're interested in seeing only the most probable prediction for each sample in the test set, then we can run this cell here, which is taking the predictions and getting the index of the prediction with the highest probability. And if we print that out, then we can see that these are a little bit easier to interpret than the previous output. So we can see for the first sample that the prediction is a zero. The second sample is a one. And just to confirm, if we go back up here, we can see that the first sample indeed has the higher probability of a label of zero, meaning no side effects. And the second sample has a higher probability of one, meaning that the patient did experience a side effect. So from these prediction results, we're able to actually see the underlying predictions, but we're not able to make much sense of them in terms of how well the model did at these predictions because we didn't supply the labels to the model during inference in the same way that we do during training. This is the nature of inference. A lot of times inference is occurring once the model has been deployed to production. So we don't necessarily have correct labels for the data that the model is inferring from. If we do have corresponding labels for our test set though, which in our case we do because we are the ones who generated the test data, then we can visualize the prediction results by plotting them to a confusion matrix, and that'll give us an overall idea at how accurate our model was at inferring on the test data. We'll see exactly how that's done in the next episode. By the way, we are currently in Vietnam filming this episode. If you didn't know, we also have a vlog channel where we document our travels and share a little bit more about ourselves. So check that out at Deep Lizard Vlog on YouTube. Also, be sure to check out the corresponding blog for this episode, along with other resources available on deeplizard.com. And check out the Deep Lizard Hive Mind, where you can gain exclusive access to perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you next time.